I am aware that not everything that happens in the locker room at the gym is appropriate to share in church, so just relax. I'd finished my workout, and I'd gone to shave, and I took the, the remaining basin out of the four basins in the bathroom, and just as I finished lathering up and I looked in the mirror, I noticed an elderly man behind the row of people at the basin brushing his teeth. And he was brushing his teeth the right way, which is you brush for so long that you get to the point where it's a choice between spitting and choking to death. <laughs> That's right, Lyndon. You can ask Lyndon and check with me afterwards for dental advice. So I'd step back from the basin and I said to him, please, please go ahead, because there wasn't any other free basins. And so he finished and he turned around and he looked at me. And I was expecting him to say, thank you. But he started off by saying, you. And then he paused. And I suddenly thought, oh dear, maybe he's going to say, you guys really shouldn't be hogging the basins by shaving in peak gym hours. Or, but he said, you are a gentleman of perception and compassion. <laughs> And that has stuck with me the whole day. It's actually stuck with me the whole week. He could have just said thanks and moved on. And I probably would have forgotten that that incident even happened. But no matter how bad my day got after that, I remembered I am a gentleman of perception and compassion. If you're going to be PC, then perceptive and compassionate are the things that you should be, right? The reason I tell that story is I'm going to ask that you let the Holy Spirit give you perception, that the Holy Spirit will turn all of you into ladies and gentlemen of perception and compassion as we look at a topic which we're all very familiar with, but I'm hoping will hit differently today. So we're back into our series of the 28 Fundamentals for Followers. We have some really cool new artwork to go with the rest of the series. Thank you very much, Sam. As Donna said right in the beginning, this church is full of people with different talents. They just step up and do things. Sam stepped up when she saw some pretty abysmal artwork <laughs> I've been using up till now and made it much better. Thank you. And the key theme that runs through this series is that the beliefs are good. It's important to have the knowledge that each 28 fundamental belief gives us about God, about our relationship with him, about the church. It's a good way to begin. But once you follow, that's when things really start to happen. And that's the focus. So today we're talking about the church. It's fundamental belief number 12. And it talks about what the church is. And it's really interesting how the word we use influences so strongly how we relate to it and how we think about something, right? So when you think of church, I'm guessing, because this is the way I use it most of the time, that church for you is, you would say, I'm going to church to have the church that the church puts on. What we're really saying is, I'm going to the building to have the event that the leadership puts on, right? The church. The church is the building. The church is what we're doing now. And the church is those leaders, local, national, global leaders that make up the church. That's how we use church. But church is so much more than that. And maybe we could say it's so much less than that. It's so much simpler than that. It's so much, so much more direct than that. Because the Greek word that is translated in all of our Bibles as church in most places, ecclesia, doesn't mean a building. It doesn't mean a service. It doesn't mean the leadership or the organization. It just means a gathering, an assembly, a community, in some translations, they use the word congregation. And it, it's not 
specifically a religious gathering, assembly, or community. In fact, there's a, an anecdote that Luke tells in the book of Acts. Luke was a doctor who investigated the life and times of Jesus Christ, interviewed eyewitnesses, and wrote the Gospel of Luke. And the follow-on, the sequel, the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. And that's Acts of the Apostles. I know when I was a kid, I was thinking, wow, the Acts of the Apostles. There's the sword of the Lord and the Acts of the Apostles. This is onward, Christian soldiers. Um, it's the Acts of the Apostles, what the Apostles did. And the same word, Ecclesia, is translated here as assembly correctly because it's talking about in the city of Ephesus, Paul had gone there to spread the gospel and the merchants there who were involved in the silver trade, who made silver idols of the goddess Artemis, saw this as a, a serious threat to their business model. If everyone started believing in the true God and stopped believing in Artemis, it's not good for business. So they got together. They assembled a whole crowd, a riot basically in the city. And Luke writes that the assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. So it's not a specifically religious connotation, although I know some of us have been to church business meetings that sound quite a lot like that, right? Not anymore. Okay, not anymore. So let's go to the very first place where that word ecclesia is used. And Jesus uses it in an interaction with his disciples, one of the most pivotal interactions that he has. They've traveled, Jesus promised that he would go through all the towns and cities. And so they're in the very northern part of the kingdom, quite an isolated but beautiful area. And Herod Philip, the son of Herod the Great, had established quite a big city and there were a few villages around it. And I think this has happened in one of the villages close to Caesarea Philippi. So the name of the area describes... The two names that are used describe the dominance of the, Ro of the Roman Empire, Caesar, and the absolute sellout that the king of the Jews, Herod Philip, was. Put the two names together and name the area Caesarea Philippi. You couldn't think of a less suitable place to launch anything, to start something new. But this is where Jesus is. And he asks his disciples, Standing there, probably out in the hot sun, this question. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they answer well. They can answer quickly because they've heard the talk in the crowds. And they say, some say you're John the Baptist, Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Jesus nods slowly and then lets his gaze travel and settle briefly on each of their faces. And then he says, but who do you say I am? One of the most important questions any of us could ever be asked. And you thought it was, do you want salad or fries with that? <laughs> who do you say I am? Peter is always the first to answer. But I think this time... Peter starts talking before he even knows what he's going to say. Because the words that he utters don't come from his reasoning. Simon Peter answers, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus, I'm standing here in front of you. I can see the sweat trickling down your forehead. I can smell that you haven't bathed for a few days. But I'm saying that you are the son of the living God. This is a huge statement. And Jesus responds on that basis. And he says, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You do not learn this from any human being. This is divine wisdom from the mouth of a human being, a simple fisherman. You'll notice 
the way that Matthew writes this. Now, Matthew was a tax collector. He spent all his time with Peter. He was called soon after Peter was called to be a disciple. And when Peter was called to be a disciple, his name wasn't Peter. His name was Simon. But when Jesus calls him, he changes his name. In many ways, Braden, or in this specific way, Braden is like Jesus. Braden always changes everyone's name. I'm sure you guys have recognized that, realized that already. I have to keep reminding him, my name isn't G. My name is G Dog. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Jesus changed Simon's name right in the beginning. And I don't think he explained to anyone why. He just said to him, I'm going to call you Simon. And now, three years later, he's explaining to Simon and Simon's friends why he's called Peter. He says, Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. Now Jesus was probably speaking Aramaic, and Cephas is the name that he gave to Peter, translated into Greek. It's Cephas, they both mean the same thing. The Greek is actually, because that's the English, Peter, the Greek is actually Petros, which basically means stone, smallish rock. And so he says to him, I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock, and Jesus uses a slightly different word here. Instead of Petros, he uses Petra, the feminine version of the, the Greek word Petra, Petros, which actually means a massive cliff or a huge foundation stone, a, a large rock. He says, you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. And here's where Ecclesia is used for the first time, translated into church, but it's, and on this, I will build my gathering, my community, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. So when that little word, this, what is Jesus talking about upon this? And there's three main interpretations that theologians have come up with. They say that he could be saying, when he talks about this rock, he's just referenced Peter, and he's using a pun or a dad joke, if you will, saying, I call you rock, and on this rock, I'm going to build the church. And so some people interpret it as, you, Peter, are going to be the foundation of my church. Other people say that Jesus had said, Peter, you are a rock, a small pebble, but on this foundation, and Jesus sort of pointed to himself when he was saying this, I will build my church. Because he refers to himself as the solid rock. Paul's writings talk about Jesus as the rock of our faith. And so the second interpretation is that Jesus was saying, I am the rock on which I'll build my church. And the third interpretation is that this refers to the statement that Peter made. The statement that Jesus Christ, the little baby that was born in Bethlehem, who lived like we've all lived, is actually, truly the Messiah, the anointed one, Emmanuel, God with us. Now, I hate making choices. So I don't think you have to choose between these three options. I think, to an extent, every single one of those three is true. And here's why. In the scripture that Jen quoted when she spoke about Peter saying that we are a royal priesthood, just a little bit before that, Peter writes this. So this is the same Peter. Let's see what his understanding was. He's talking to the Christians at the time, and he's saying, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. Right? He understands that Jesus is the foundation of our faith. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. But then Peter expands this rock or stone metaphor, and he says, and you are living stones that God is building in to his spiritual temple. Yes, I was one of the first, says Peter. 
myself and James and Paul and John and the other apostles were part of that foundation because we just happened to be alive when Jesus came. And we got to be part of the very beginning of this ecclesia. But everybody who comes after, in every generation, you are living stones that form part of God's ecclesia, the church established by Jesus. Every generation gets to reflect who they say Jesus is. Paul gives us even more insight into these three things. Jesus being the rock upon which the church is built. Peter and all the followers that would come after him being part of that process of building God's church. And the statement, the foundational truth on which the church is built, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, all being part of what Jesus said. Paul writes in, to the church in Ephesus, so now you, are Gentile, you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. So I think it's quite justified to say that Jesus meant all three of those things when he was speaking to his disciples there in Caesarea Philippi. So let's come back to the second noteworthy thing in this statement here in Matthew 16. Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build. You know, as human beings, we're always so tempted, right from when we are one and a half, and we've just learned to speak and do stuff, and somebody tries to help us, no, do itself. Jesus reminds us right in the beginning, I will build this church. I will invite you to join me. I want you to be part of this, but remember, I will do the building. That's the only way it can be successful. And Jesus also reminds us, sorry, Jesus was pro prophesying at this point. At this point when he's got 12 people around him, 12, and one of them would already abandon him. Well, they would all abandon him, but one would actually betray him. Jesus is prophesying because he knows what will happen. He knows that soon after this time, there will be an explosion. 3,000 people baptized in one day, and from there it's just exponential until this tiny ecclesia grows to fill the earth. Because Jesus says in John 13, I'm praying not only for these disciples that he's with at the time, just before the crucifixion, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Jesus saw into the future to the 2nd of March, 2024, to each one of you sitting here in the pews at Helderberg College Church, all who will ever believe in me. The next thing, the second last thing I want you to notice in this verse is that Jesus is saying, I will build my church. It's tragic that within a few hundred years, the church would be taken over by men hungry for their own power, their own glory, their own fame. But Jesus has always had people who believe that the church, the ecclesia, is his. In every generation, there are people that have stood up against the mainstream and reminded everybody what the true calling of ecclesia is. The last thing that Jesus says, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. If God is the source of life, what is the power of hell? death. And just before his own death, which he knows will shake these 12 men who are listening to him now, to their core, Jesus is making a statement that death will not conquer the church, will not conquer 
this gathering, this ecclesia that he's called people to. His own death won't conquer it. The death of every believer subsequently won't be the end of the church. In fact, Jesus' death was just the start. That's when things kicked off. When Jesus died and rose again, that was the catalyst for the growth of this ecclesia through history. So this is the wording of the actual belief from the SDA 28 Fundamentals. And I want you to see that it's based on all the scripture we've read, plus a bunch of other scripture, which we don't have time to go through. And this is the fundamental definition of church, of ecclesia. It's the community of believers who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's all. It's not the community of believers who pay their tithe regularly, who are kind to people, who attend every week. It's the community of believers who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's not for people who've got it together because they don't need a Savior. It's for every single one of us who feel unworthy. And it's probably the biggest tragedy in our world that so many churches are the last place that people go when they don't feel worthy. That is why Jesus called it ecclesia. It's not a building. It's not a membership. It's not an organization. It's simply a gathering of people who confess their need of Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I want everybody, not just to listen to that, I want you to believe it. Many of us are in good places. We, don't, we feel maybe we make the mistake on the opposite side, that we really are worthy. But for every one of you and for every time you feel like that, there's a time or another person who's sitting here feeling totally worthless. You're not. Jesus is your Lord and Savior. He came for you. He called this. This exists for you. And as this second service, 2S, turns 8 on Tuesday, I'm really proud of everyone that's here and everything that's happening. We've got a long way to go. We're not perfect, but I think we're getting a lot right. Thank you. We are called out from the world and we join together. For these are the things we do together as church. We worship, we fellowship, we instruct each other and ourselves in the word. We celebrate communion, which we'll do in a couple of weeks' time. We are here to serve each other and our community, and we're here to proclaim the gospel in whatever place and in whatever time God places us. The church derives authority from Christ. Another of the tragedies of where the church veers and things get very weird is that some churches have established men as the authority, but our authority comes only from Christ. The church is God's family, adopted by him as children. Its members live on the basis of the new covenant. The church is the body of Christ. The church is often referred to as a hospital. And that's a really good comparison because Jesus himself said, I didn't come for the people who are well and healthy. I came for those who are sick and suffering. But there's limitations to the analogy because what happens to people who are sick and they go to hospital and they get well? They leave, right? So we don't want that to happen in the church. So maybe the church is also like a gym. A gym where people say to each other, you are a lady or a gentleman of perception and compassion. A place where we all come to support each other in the goal of becoming healthier spiritually healthier, a place where you can work out on your own, but you're at risk of dropping something heavy on yourself. 
And so there's always people to spot. For those of you who don't go to gym often, spot isn't, ah, oh, I spot you, bro. It's helping someone with a heavy weight. Okay. The church is like a hospital. The church is like a gym. What the church is not like is a fortress designed to keep the people inside safe and protected from the outside world. It's a museum where we celebrate the ancient successes of the past. The church is a living, breathing gathering of people who confess Christ as their Lord and Savior. At Christ's return in triumph, he will present her, the church, to himself, a glorious church. Read Revelation, it's beautiful. The faithful of all the ages, the purchase of his blood, not having spot or wrinkle, but holy and without blemish. At his return, holy and without blemish. I just want to put that disclaimer out there. Those of you who think that there aren't any hypocrites in the church are in for a rude awakening. Until Jesus returns, there will always be hypocrites in the church. I'm a hypocrite. But we are traveling together. We have declared together that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. We are here to support each other in that journey so that one day we can stand without spot or blemish. And so, the church. What is the church? The church is also known as you. Or if you come from Texas or Durbanville, y'all. We are the church. The church, at the end of the service, will get up, walk out the door. The church will be get into a car and drive home. The church will have lunch. On Monday morning, the church will turn off the alarm clock and get up and go to work. The church will pull teeth, teach kids, process debit orders. We are all the church. And that means you are part of something huge, right? Doesn't that make you feel, wow. We are part of the body of Christ. It doesn't get bigger than that. It doesn't get bigger than that. And all you need to do to be part of that is confess Jesus as Lord and Savior and then follow where Jesus leads. Keeping in mind that when the world looks at you as the church, it's not just looking at this building on the hillside. It's looking at each of us. It's looking at Ian. It's looking at B. It's looking at Gareth. Who do we say Jesus is? For our closing song, we're going to answer that question. And I would like you not just to sing the words because they're up on the screen, but use this opportunity, if you've done it before, to do it again, to confess who Jesus is. And if you've never done it, if you're watching online, if you're here today because someone said they'd give you free lunch afterwards, and this is the first time that you have an opportunity, I invite you to take it. There's no point in delaying any further. Confess today. Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, and you want to be part of his ecclesia. Amen.